Hi, everybody. I am Elohim Leafar. You probably recognize me for this complicated accent. This person next to me is Joshua Allen Cross. Uh, if you see my channel during the last year, probably you know that I made this cheesy episode series that was Elohim and Friends. I bring all my friends and we talk each other about magic, witchery, food, and funny stuff. Uh, the idea is to some, do something like that one, but now this is for a YouTube, a YouTube channel so everybody can access without has an account or something like that. Uh, for this episode, I bring my friend that I really adore, admire, and they stalk too much at a moment that is sometimes insane. Uh, my friend is Joshua. Uh, you probably will recognize him because he's the author of American Brujeria. He's J. Allen Cross. He's a blogger for Patios Pagan that everybody knows is the biggest blog platform on this community. Joshua is a medium, is a paranormal investigator, occult specialist. He has, he's a witch of Mexican, Native American, and uh, European blood. He specializes in folk magic. His book, American Brujeria, was number one in the list of bestsellers of Amazon in Hispanic American Studies and Hispanic American Demographic Studies, where actually today we, when we are recording is number one. Also, he's the host of the podcast Invoking Witchcraft. That is very popular in these moments. And I listen to the podcast every week because he's very, very awesome. So in the end of this video, I'm totally sure that you will go to stalk him just like I do every week. Hi, Joshua. Hi, hello. Thank you so much for having me here. How are you doing? I'm doing really good, actually. We, the weather has been extremely hot here, and it's finally started to cool down. Looks like we might get some rain, which is what we've been praying for. So here's hoping for <laughs> a rainy weekend. That's great. Uh, Joshua, I know that you live in Oregon. Mm -hmm. I am the immigrant here. So please let me know which is your favorite part of your city. Oh, favorite part of my city? Um where I live, we do um, the holidays, especially Christmas up really big. Um, Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all of that stuff in, in my city. Um, we, we do it really intensely. <laughs> People get very into it. Um, and I love that because I, I love the holidays. Um, I love participating in it. And I love it when people have a reason to be happy, um, especially with each other. And I think that the holidays are a perfect excuse for that. So I, I really love that about where I live. That's very nice. Thank you for the answer because I don't know the country. So every time that I do a video with someone, I try to ask about their cities. In that way, I have a projection of how is the country. I told you before that I don't make any complicated questions here. So what's your vision about the politics now? No, no, oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Joshua, uh, uh, I can be serious. I really try, but after se two seconds, I just lost myself. I can't. Joshua, uh, you are a Mexican, Native American, European person. Mm -hmm. So you are a blend of a lot of things, and we can see that. Uh, we can read that because in your book, it's a projection of that. Uh, when we see you, you don't look like... Um, a stereotypical person. You look very ethnic. You look uh, very interesting. We can say good looking. So uh, how do you feel being part of that, being, bringing that to the community? Because this community, uh, when I arrived five years ago, was entirely different. And, from, and I come from Latin America. I don't have the opportunity to grow in the United States. So how do you see that when you see the rest of the community? How do you see that you fit in there? What things do you feel like you bring to the community? Well, it's so interesting of being someone who is mixed and, and anyone who is any sort of mixed will understand this is when you grow up, you feel very, um, you feel very isolated, you feel very alone. Um, because in a lot of ways, when you belong to two or more different places, then where do you go? Where is where is home, right? Because sometimes, you know, especially those of us who are both kind of of Mexican and American descent, then, you know, you go over to hang out with the Mexican people, and they're like, you're not Mexican, <laughs> like, you don't speak Spanish, like all this stuff. And so I'm like, oh, okay, so, but then you go over with the with the American people, 
and to them you're you're completely foreign as someone who's brown and who has you know ancestry in Mexico and things like that so you don't really feel like you fit in in any of the categories you almost feel sort of rejected by all of them um, but then as I grew up I started to think of this especially recently as kind of a, a superpower or a gift to be someone who is a part of multiple places. And as I get older and the more of this work I do, I realize what I'm here to do is, is take two different sides and kind of squash them together and, and kind of create that connection between them. Um, that's really important. And so I, I was not only doing that with, you know, American Brujeria, um, where I'm talking about kind of the American experience and the Mexican experience and kind of bringing that magic together. Um, also in my next book, I'll be doing something similar as well, where I take one world and another world that don't go together and putting them together. So apparently that's just what I'm here to do is, is be a bridge person. And so I'm really hoping that everyone who is mixed or, or kind of belongs to more than one community or more than one world feels empowered to not just live in both worlds, but also connect them together. Because um, I, I think that's what we're, we're here to do, honestly, is, is just to come together and make connection, essentially. Exactly. Uh, one of the, that I, I actually, that's the thing that I really like when I received your book to do the endorsement. Mm -hmm. uh, because before that, I, I, I'm not very as, uh, a social person. I, I don't have many friends. I just talk everybody, especially my friends, but I don't have many. Uh, I remember that you were the, uh, I, I remember that I just knew you for being a blogger in Patios Pagan. You have a blog, very interesting, where you always bring very um, hard topics like cultural appropriation and these kind of things. Uh, topics that usually I don't never refer because I feel like, like I, my arguments are not so heavy like yours. You, you have all the facts and information that I don't have. When I received your book, I was like, Oh, Joshua, that name, I, I, I think I know that name, and I know that that was the same blogger. So I made a little thing, oh, this will be very interesting to read. And from the page one, I fall in love because this is the thing. I've never endorsed books that are interesting. I just endorse books where I feel in love of the book. And I really like the book because you use Spanglish a lot. You use many uh, prayings and words in, in Spanish. And I understand that you don't talk Spanish, but you write it very well. Uh, I understand the perfect context of the language. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, the, the, for example, in the page 46, I haven't noted because when I opened the book the first time, when I have it, my physical copy, I find here uh, the Guadalupe Machete, words that in English is, are, are not very common. And I really enjoy that, that you put so much about the culture in there. You just not, not, you not just, sorry for my English, not just sit down and grind and trying to fit in the language. Oh, I need to make this comfortable for everybody. You just keep it how it is. Mm -hmm. And that's very nice. That's really nice because it's like when people go to your Instagram, to your Facebook page, it's very yourself. You are not trying to fit with everyone else. It's very representative of your culture, the colors, the uh, the mazorca, I don't know how to say that uh, in English, uh, the virgins, all of this stuff, uh, very well made, so representative of the culture is very nice. It's like it, all your Instagram page is like a museum. Uh, I'm very on Instagram with everybody because I think that Instagram represents how people it is. Some people is very organized, some people is a disaster, some people just uh, throw a picture, a selfie on there every month. It's very representative of that. And yours is like, you go there and it's like a museum of Mexican culture with so many elements, with so many information, with so very long, but very well-made explanations about every item that is very nice. And I find that also in the book, I really love it. And I was so happy when I see it in number one uh, because I am a very good stalker. I remember when the book comes out, I was in your social media every day, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. What he's doing? Let me see how he's doing his book. Let me call my friends in Spain. Let me, let me see if they has the book in the library. I need to know. And everybody was very happy with the book because everybody feel representative of the book. 
And like you was saying, uh, it's bring something to the community and you are bringing a lot to the community. And I'm pretty sure that I represent a lot of people when I say thank you for that. Thank you so much. That that really warms my heart a lot. And I'm, I'm so happy to be able to bring it. And I feel um, that it's, That's exactly what I was trying to do. And, and so I just want to say thank you. Joshua, one of the questions that I received from one of your followers uh, is, do you remember your first book on witchcraft or magic, which was? I do. Um, I actually still have it on the shelf behind me. Um, it's called Charm Spells. And it's by um, a woman named Ileana Abrav. Um, I believe she's from Australia. Um, but it was just a, a very simple book of spells for um, teenagers, things like um, spells to help you make friends, how to protect your locker from people who might try and break into it, um, how to um, protect yourself from bullies, um, all kinds of stuff. I was probably 10 or 11 when I got it. Um, and it was absolutely perfect for me. And I used that book relentlessly um, for years before I got another one. Um, and it really gave me an entire introduction to it at the time to one of my um, mom's friends was also helping me kind of get started on the path. Um, and so I, I use that book for years and I still have it. And it's a very nostalgic thing for me to go back and look at and kind of have those memories. Thank you for answering that. Um, Joshua, how was the process to create the book? Which parts do, do you remember about the creation of the book, about how was writing about, how was take this idea, this conception, how put all of this in paper? <laughs> it was such a funny, um, it was such a funny thing because I had originally set out to write a book on um, American folk magic in general, just kind of across the board, um, you know, just kind of folk magic as it's practiced here in America. Um, but, and I had actually started, I was several chapters in when I sent it to Judica, who's my editor. Um, and then I was actually going to fly to Pantheacon to meet with her to see if she wanted to, you know, pick up my book. And after I had sent it to her, and I'm on the plane on my way over there, I'm realizing that I've bitten off much more than I can chew. Because when it comes to American folk magic, you know, when we come to the United States, there's so many different cultures here. And there's so much really intense history that comes with this place that I didn't know how to do a good enough job to, um, to not only do it justice for these other cultures, but also how do you then navigate things like cultural appropriation, you know, without becoming a huge hypocrite by writing a book on other people's culture stuff. Um, and so I'm like, I, I began to kind of have a panic. And then um, it was actually Anwen Avalon who suggested, she's like, she's like, why don't you just narrow it down? She's like, just focus it more on brujeria. And I was like, well, I, I don't, I don't do that, you know, the real traditional Mexican, you know, brujería. But after she suggested that, I realized that there are so many people in the United States who are of some sort of Latin American descent, um, who are practicing kind of their cultural magic. And whether or not it is technical, traditional brujería, that's what they're calling it. Um, and so that's when I get out my laptop and I write all night and I have about three chapters and the next day I go to see Judica and I'm like, hi, so um, that that manuscript that I sent you originally, she's like, oh, I haven't read it yet. And I'm like, good, throw it in the trash. I have something else for you. Forget that, that not happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, just pretend I never ever sent you that. It was, it was very nicely written. It was great, but it was one of those things I'm like, oh no, I can't even do this. And so I told her about what I wanted to do. And I told her about my, my vision for American Brujeria. And she was like, yes. That is exactly what we're looking for. That's exactly what we want. She's like, get me your chapters. I'm like, okay. So then I leave my meeting with her. And again, I write all night. I didn't sleep at all when I was in San Jose for Pantheacon. I just wrote all night long. Um, and so 
I ended up um, putting this together, but then again, realizing that I have such a responsibility when you put out a book, you have such a responsibility to do it correctly. And not only was I now putting out a book, but also I was putting out a book in which I was speaking for other Mexican American people, which is a huge population. And so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just writing from my perspective or about my personal practice. I, I wanted to see how other people were doing this. So I started getting in contact with every Mexican American person that I knew and being like, hey, like, can I, can I interview you? Can I talk with you? And what was so funny is a lot of them were like, oh, like, I don't, I don't do any of that folk magic stuff. Like, you've got the wrong person. But I'm like, wait, 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 like, just, just hear me out here. And I, <laughs> I would start to ask them things like, you know, about, um, you know, uh, there's all these like superstitions, like, you know, if you sweep over someone's feet or, um, or things like that, I start asking them about that and they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. And then this and then that. And then you would see this light bulb go off that they'd be like, that's magic. Yeah, that's magic. And I'm like, yes, it is. Um, so, so it was so neat to be able to interact with people and get to notice how just normal this magic is in, in our culture, because, people don't even think about it as magic. It's just stuff that you do. You do this for good luck. You put this over here to make sure that you don't have nightmares or, or whatever it is. It's just normal things to, to a lot of us in this culture. And that was really neat to see um, not only other people's perspectives on it, but then also to reconnect people with the fact that this is magic, that this is something unique and interesting. Um, so I, I loved that part of it as well, getting to kind of know them as, at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. I think that we, we passed this question in some way, but is how is being Mexican in this community uh, being part of a minority during the last years? Because we have uh, uh, some complicated uh, last four years. Mm -hmm. uh, if, do you see that something changed in the community, in the metaphysical co community, or in the medical community, or in the Latin community? Do you feel something changed? There, there have been some changes, um, especially in sort of the, um, dare I say, political climate of kind of like online magical community, things like that, especially when it comes to things like cultural appropriation. Um, it, it wasn't really that long ago when people actually started talking about cultural appropriation, which is an important topic. And it's something that we should all kind of be aware of. Um, at the same time though, when it comes to online communities, people get very interested in um, pointing out everyone else's mistakes in order to try to um, hide their own, which means that things like, you know, being aware of cultural appropriation tend to snowball. And recently it's gotten a little concerning online as far as um, the conversations are concerned because it's turned from be respectful to have no contact with other cultures. And it's, it's kind of trending towards racial purity very quickly. Um, and, and that's historically never gone well. That's always been a very bad idea. That's, <laughs> um, so that's something that, that is sort of concerning me. And at the same time too, a lot of these communities that are minorities um, are being talked over. So someone was posting the other day about um, talking about the, the Nazar, the, the blue evil eye idea and how they're from that culture. But when they use it, somebody who's not from their culture starts yelling at them because it's a closed practice because we've decided everything is now a closed practice. Instead exactly. of just deciding to respect it, we, we say it's just completely off limits, which I, there's middle ground there <laughs> that we should explore. But, um, but it's, it's very interesting to see that now we've almost attempted to protect minorities so much that we've gone around the bend and are now like re-demonizing their practices, telling people that they can't be anywhere near them, can't use them, can't touch them. Um, so it's it's kind of gone around the bend again. And we, we've started, we, we've ended up back where we started a little bit, um, if not a little worse for wear. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, if we continue to have very honest conversations about, you know, 
culture appropriation, what it really means, um, things that are actually problems and whatnot, then I'm hoping that we can sort of correct that a little bit. Um, and I'm hoping that people will start listening to, to these minority communities when they say things like, you can wear a blue glass bead and it's fine, <laughs> like, you know. Yes, uh, I remember this was a hard topic when I arrived in the United States because I come from Venezuela that is a very, uh, we have many tourists in there. We have so many tourists because everybody wants to go to the beach, everybody wants to go to the mountain, everybody wants to stay there. And it's, it's a really beautiful country, uh, physically and the views is, is very nice. The people is another thing. But uh, being there, you have so many cultures around because we are practically, we are literally in the middle. We have Brazil, we have the Amazon, we have Colombia, everybody tra travels there. Uh, so many people from Central America, when happens the earthquakes in IT, many years ago, they bring a lot of people from IT to Venezuela and they blend with our culture. And you don't speak about these kind of things in a country like that. Uh, so when when I just listen, and I'm totally honest here, I just listen one time in all my life in Venezuela, the topic about cultural appropriation in one exposition in the high school uh, was something very weird, was like, oh, so I can do this? Oh, okay. And never again I listen anything about it in my years of college. I end the college and I never listen anything about this topic because in some way is. The culture is very blended, but we continue knowing who do everything. Oh, this is a Peruvian team. This is a Colombian food. This is a Mexican party. When you arrive in the United States, when I arrived in the United States be, being an immigrant, this was a hard, complicated topic because everybody talks about it. And I was in the middle like, I really don't know why people is fighting for this. So I admit that the first years probably was very responsible because I don't take any position. I was like, if people want to do it, it's not my problem. But then I started to read more, more uh, about it. Uh, you was one of the, of the blogs that I read about it. And I understand, oh, this is happening. Okay, this is dangerous because you, in some way, if you don't go to the extreme and trying to put people in boxes, like, okay, you, you are a blue person, you need to continue all your life being blue, stay in the box. If you don't go to that extreme, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a re really complicated topic because you need to find a line, uh, you need to mark a line between this is our community and we are open to everybody and this is a, a world that where we don't want to have frontiers and passport, we want to be a free world, but at the same time we need to respect different limitations about our culture and don't try to bring things about a different culture and make money without the permission of that culture, please. I started to understand that part when I was here, but like, three, four years and was, and in that moment I say, oh, I was being so irresponsible of my life. <laughs> Thanks, I never take pictures about it. Uh, but yeah, it's a very hard topic and we don't have many voices uh, talking about it. You are one of them. I really appreciate that you do that work. Thank you again. Joshua, uh, here you don't need to elaborate too much depending on how comfortable you, uh, you feel with the topic, but uh, thinking this into account, I come from a different country where uh, the LGBTQ plus da, 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 da community is more limited, is illegal, it is totally restrange to be married. I, I literally take an airplane to another country to marry there with my partner. Uh, and in my country, I continue being single. If I travel to, today, I am single in my country because they don't recognize uh, my wedding. So it's, it's a very complicated topic. Uh, you grow up here. Uh, how do you feel that the that space, that small space of, for the queer community inside of the metaphysical community, feels now? Because uh, the metaphysical community con continue being yeah, we are in, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube, we are whatever, but we continue being in some way a minority. So the queer community continue being a minority inside of the minority. I mean, the metaphysical community who are identified like queer people. How do you feel uh, that you feel in there? Uh, how do you feel that, uh, I mean, it's some ideas or conceptions that you want to share about it? 
So I I love how intensely the queer community has embraced um, spirituality and kind of this this witchy life. <laughs> um, I I love that, and it also seems so made for us at the same time because so many people who who are queer um, and grew up you know some sort of Christian ended up kind of coming to to witchcraft spirituality all of this um, in order to kind of escape their their christian upbringing um, but at the same time to also find a place that really welcomes them um, and when we look at the art of magic of witchcraft it's very inherently queer it goes against the normal current of the way that things are supposed to be done um, you know, the path of the witch is one that always kind of dares to be different, the one that steps apart from everybody else and goes to the places that other people may not be willing to go. Um, and in a lot of ways, in, in a lot of ways, um, my experience of being gay and my experience of being a witch are extremely similar in the way that it wasn't necessarily something that I chose. Um, it was something I pretended not to be for a while. Um, but at the end of the day, it wasn't something that I necessarily had a say in. It was who I am. And it's how God made me, which is another thing too, because people are always like, you know, how can you be, you know, Christian and gay and a witch? I'm like, I don't know. It, God made me this way. So apparently there's a plan for it. And I just, I don't question it. So here we go. Um, I just figure I would have been made differently if they wanted me to. Um, but the the practice itself of, of witchcraft, the way that it is subversive, but also we have this way of finding the, the in-between. So, you know, we talk about liminal spaces where, you know, two things meet. These are things like crossroads and doorways and, you know, midnight and, you know, twilight, all of these things, these very magical times are magical because these are where kind of two things meet. And at that point, you are, you are in between them um, in which you create a paradox. You know, if you stand at the center of a crossroads, are which, which road are you on? Well, you're on both and neither at the same time. It's a weird, impossible place. Um, and I find um, queerness to sort of be like that, this weird in-between place where kind of um, anything is possible, right? You know, there's so many more options in the liminal space as far as, you know, um, gender expression, sec uh, sexual orientation, all of these things are, are so, um, it's, it's almost like finding, um, um, how do I put it? Like, like, you know, when you're on like a computer thing or, and you're trying to pick a color yeah. on it and there's like the whole enormous spectrum and on one end there's black and one on them there's white. And then in the middle, there's all the colors, right? And I feel like that's kind of um, where we find uh, magic in the liminal space, but that's also where we find kind of queerness, where suddenly all of this color comes out and there's so many different shades and hues and things like that. Um, it's very similar in the way that we handle magic is the way that we handle queerness. So I really think that um, that the queer community, without even realizing it, we were built very specifically to handle like magic and witchcraft and for it to kind of be our arena. Um, that's not to say, of course, that, you know, says that people can't participate. You definitely can. Um, but I, I think that there's a, a, a very special connection between queerness and, and magic. Yes, uh, I, I come from Amazon. Uh, people, uh, I mean, the, the community there, um, we can say that the metaphysical community in there, I mean, the, the people in the tribe who practice some kind of shamanism or curanderismo or some kind of uh, any expression of magic that we have in there, any, any expression of native magic, they are very queer people. I mean, not just the makeup and, and the feathers, uh, but also uh, all the, the expression that they do about being yourself, but also uh, uh, embracing yourself in many ways. They are a very open community. And it's very weird because uh, we have a lot of Catholic influence from the church there in Amazon. But at the same time, the tribes, they continue uh, doing their own rituals every year. And most of these rituals, when you see the chief of the tribe, uh, that is a man dressed like some kind of native woman with 
with the feeders and the makeup and doing the dancing and chanting and everything else, trying to embrace the femininity of the spirit. And for the other side, you see a, a woman of the tribe, a woman from the tribe, doing the contrary dress, uh, like uh, like the chief, like a man. Uh, they are trying to bring all of these both spirits together, uh, and we believe in this. Uh, in, in I think that in American people say uh, third spirit or third soul is a person of the third sex that, uh, that in Spanish we say different. Uh, is feels like that because uh, in these small communities very close to the tribe, you see that people is very open about sexuality, very incredibly open. Uh, I feel fortunate because when, when uh, for one side, most of my family uh, has a very distant relation from me because I'm gay, but the tribe was, oh, you are gay, okay, perfect. They bring me, they teach me a lot of rituals and the stuff that was prohibited for everyone else. So I feel special in some, in some way because I feel protected. And I see that in this community in America, in North America, but a little more open. And I like that because in my country it's entirely different. Mm. Uh, Joshua, uh, how was, this is a complicated question. Uh, how was 2020 for you? Oh, um, yeah, breathe, breathe. <laughs> I I feel kind of bad saying this sometimes, but um, I I did very well in in 2020. Um, I was lucky enough to have um, a certain amount of security through it, which was wonderful. Um, and for me, a person who who struggles with um, nearly crippling anxiety just all day, every day. Um, there was something about having a deadly virus spreading everywhere that actually made me feel a lot calmer because I'm constantly looking for danger. And then when that happened, I'm like, oh, there it is. I, I see it. It's over there. I know where it I is. Find okay. It. Right. Exactly. I found it. Now I can relax because the world is ending exactly like I thought it was. Um, so, so I, it did, it, it was okay for me. Um, I also, it gave me the time to actually write my book, which was wonderful. Um, and it really forced me to kind of begin doing what I've always known I'm supposed to be doing. I'm very stubborn. And so spirit will be like, you need to do the magic full time. And I'm like, no, that's not realistic. I need like a normal job. And spirit's like, no. And I'm like, yes. And spirit's like deadly pandemic. You don't have a job anymore. And I'm like, yeah okay, I guess we're doing the magic full-time now and writing full-time now. Um, so it, it was, it was of course a struggle. There was, there was a lot of times where I, um, where things got very real um, in my life and in my community, but it really brought me to where I feel like I'm supposed to be finally. I finally feel like I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. I, I feel like it very much put me on the right path. And I think that a lot of people are kind of experiencing this where they're coming out of the pandemic or, or I guess coming out into the middle of the pandemic as we are now, um, a very different person than they were when they went in. Um, and so I, I find a lot of blessings in this ability to um, have, have something that just drastically reorients me in a good way. Um, I, I tend to resist those things, but they always end up being uh, being very good for me in the end. And so I'm I'm very grateful for it. Thanks for express all of that. Uh, I feel the same in, same in many ways because actually I work all day from my home. Mm -hmm. uh, I work in magic and I work with marketing and I work for three different agencies at the same time, but I work from my home. So for me, there was so much change uh, but this in some ways, in many ways, forced me to do more work and discover that I can do more work because I was in some kind of comfort zone in my place with my own schedule. And now I, I have so much work and so much clients and so much accounts to do and things to do. And I discovered like, oh, I can do all of this and I'm not tired, so I can do more. So uh, what was very nice was a very sad, complicated year full of anxiety and the news really don't help too much. Uh, but I, I, told, I told you uh, before we started to recording, uh, I am like a, a very old man. I see the news in the morning, drinking my coffee. Oh, look how it's ruling the world. Look how it's the politics <laughs> now. 
I am that kind of person every morning. Uh, and this was very complicated. It was the moment when I literally stopped watching news for like six months. Mm -hmm. Then comes January and I say, okay, I come, I come back to, to my routine. Um, but thank you for sharing that because a lot of people feel some kind of guilty. You know, the, uh, this feeling like, oh, so many people feel bad. So many people lost people, lost jobs, homes. So they feel guilty to admit that, yeah, yes, you have a nice year and it's okay. Other people were struggling, you were struggling uh, probably in a different way, but now you are doing well and, and we feel guilty about it. A lot of people feel in that way, so it's, it's, not, so, uh, it's not something complicated. Uh, to end, because uh, I, I don't want to take all your time, you, you need to write a new book. Uh, Joshua, um, you have a podcast called Invoking Witchcraft. That is very nice be, uh, because you always bring these uh, amazing uh, topics. Uh, you have many guests and uh, you have your co-host who talk with you. Um, it's very well made. I mean, the, the production, the, the, the audio uh, is in everywhere. Uh, everybody loves your podcast. And the link will be below in the video. Uh, how was the idea about the podcast? Oh, it, well, it first started, um, I had been kind of talking with, like sort of friendly with, with Britain online for, for a while. And then just out of the blue one day, I get a message from them that's like, hey, I have a business proposal for you. Can I have your email address? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? And so they send me um, an email. I, I open it up. The first line reads like, hey, I would like to start a podcast and I'd like to start a podcast with you. And I'm like, done, <laughs> done, sold. Um, and Britain is such a wonderful human. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with them, their Instagram is at Archaic Honey. Um, and they're so deeply connected with the land and the land spirits and their path of magic is very similar to mine. Um, so we we got, we got along extremely well. Um, we have really interesting conversations with one another about, um, about the work and about um, things that we feel are important. We see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. Um, so I, I could not have asked for a better co-host. Um, and they actually do a lot of kind of the background stuff as far as the, um, the audio files and the recordings and stuff. And I do more of kind of the social media and the interview questions and things like that. So, so we, we fit together very nicely to make the podcast happen. Um, and the podcast itself, for, for those of you who, who might just be hearing about it for the first time, is uh, it's called Invoking Witchcraft. And it's mostly um, witchcraft based. Um, we'll have discussions uh, between them and I about um, different types of magic. And we'll talk about plant magic. We have an episode on like shoe magic. And then we have guests um, that come in. And, but we also tend to every so often dart out into kind of a, a weird side path. We had one episode about, um, people who aren't people. And we're actually tomorrow recording um, a podcast with someone who does, um, they go out into the woods and look for Bigfoot and have had some encounters um, with this being. And so we like to kind of get out into the weird area every so often uh, and, and find something out there. So that's kind of how the podcast came to be and kind of what we're about. And, and you can find us wherever podcasts are found. Yes, thank you. Just to clarify, because I'm totally sure that I say something uh, uh, wrong in the past. Your co-host, uh, I don't know how to put this in English correctly. She is they, correct? Um, yes, they, they kind of go back and forth. Um, sometimes they use she, um, most of the time they use they. Um, so it's it's kind of in between right now. Okay, 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 okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to clarify, I, I am an old person. I don't know anything about this. I, I am the old man yelling to the eye planes. <laughs> You're so welcome. In the, in the plaza. <laughs> thank you, Yosha. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate uh, for your followers. They know where they can find you. Please buy the book. Please support your authors. Please support the podcast because Joshua is doing an amazing job. And I always repeat this in, in interviews and the stuff. Uh, we don't have many spaces in this community. So those small spaces that we have 
virtual spaces or physical spaces where we can be the person who we are, which is um, magicians, warlocks, mage, whatever is the name that you prefer to put on your practice. These places are very small are, and not too much. So try to support these spaces, podcast, books, bookstores, try to support them, please. Uh, the links for the podcast of Joshua are below in the link and his book and everything else. Thank you, Joshua. You are amazing. Thank you so much for having me here. Bye.